Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is my great privilege to be interviewing Chris Saka, who I, all of you know and who know, needs no introduction, so I'm not going to bother with one. Chris, thank you for joining us today. Hey, it's awesome to be here. It's great. Great to see you. So, Chris, I thought we could start with kind of the big news of the moment, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it's great news. It allocates more than $300 billion to energy and climate reform, including $60 billion for boosting renewable energy infrastructure in manufacturing like wind turbines and solar panels. That's great. At the same time, it fell short of what climate activists really wanted to see. I just was wondering, what do you make of it? I mean, look, the president himself, and this is not to break decorum, but the president himself called it a big fucking deal. And it is. It's a huge step forward for our industry, for our country and the planet. No doubt about it. And bless the activists. I love where their hearts are, but we have to be pragmatic about this. And we don't have time for purity tests. I mean, literally, even Greta Thunberg came out recently and endorsed nuclear power as a great alternative to coal, which is a position she would have never taken even six months ago. But under the circumstances and the dire situation on the planet right now, we have to be pragmatic about it. And so we loved seeing what ended up coming out in the IRA. It was better than we could have expected, frankly. And we're glad everyone got to the table and hammered out a solution. Can I ask, were you involved in this at all? I mean, were they were you like consulting uh, a consultant for anyone? No, we, we weren't actually. I have an allergy to Washington. And so okay. one of the reasons we started Lower Carbon was after years of basically rebuilding the Democratic tech stack, I got a little burned out by a process that's so many degrees removed from the ultimate solution. And so we built lower carbon to say, look, we can build climate solutions now where it's up to us to deliver something that consumers and businesses want to buy from us. And if we have any relationship with government, it's government as a buyer. And so our business isn't predicated on any government handouts or subsidies. If free money falls out of the sky, we'll take it. But everything we've done now makes sense because the unit economics are there to go ahead and compete head to toe with base with with products that are founded on and predicated on petroleum. And so we can beat them in the market and provide better alternatives for consumers now. And so it was actually just a bonus and that uh, that the IRA got passed, but we weren't counting on it. It's incredible. I mean, your timing, not to flatter you too much, but is really remarkable. I mean, considering that. Even if we were to enter into recession at this point, this money is now going to be flowing into the economy, you know, making sort of, you know, climate investing relatively bulletproof. Uh, so kudos to you. And it sounds like also this bill might even be much bigger than people imagine right now because some of these uh, credits are uncapped, I guess. So with regard to EV and um, other measures to make homes more efficient. So I saw one estimate that said really it could end up spending like twice as much money, which of course will encourage more or private investment as well. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, and I think there's catalytic effects all around. And so just investment in technology is that once you start breaking cost curves, then it's compounding effects there. But I would step back and say, this space is recession-proof even without the IRA. So essentially everything we're doing at Lower Carbon is providing a substitute good. I mean, that's what, it, it almost feels unfair. You know, you spend years building Twitter and you put it up in the app store and you hope somebody gives a damn. And it could be a really well-designed product, but maybe no one cares. Whereas everything we're building right now, we actually know the demand for it. And, and if we deliver a better, cheaper, faster, cooler, easier to use, sexier product, then we'll grow the market even. And so I actually think this is some of the easiest investing we've done. And so even as a recession hits and belts are tightened, people are looking for ways to save money whether it's individual consumers or it's businesses looking around, how do we save money? And we are riding those tailwinds. And so it's funny, we, we sent out our investor update recently and I really hammered on our team to find investments to write down, to go ahead and take those valuations down to reflect what was happening in the public tech markets. And it was hard to do because so many of our companies are exceeding their already wild targets for growth right now because of what's happening, the war in Ukraine, the shortages of energy facing Europe, overall climate disasters around the planet, and the, the commitments that companies have made to decarbonize, and the reality that clean energy and clean products are reaching price parity are just massive, massive tailwinds that we're trying to keep up with, frankly.
Right, right. Well, so you busted out of the gate last year with an $800 million fund. Then I saw in the spring you announced a $350 million fund that was focused exclusively on decarbonization efforts. I'm just wondering, why break that out? Why not commingle those bets with your other bets? No, so that's actually a little different. That's a carbon removal fund. And so carbon removal is a nascent industry where it's actively sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. So basically carbon pollution we put in the atmosphere, we got to get back out. And it was the IPCC, the kind of group of the most objective scientists in the world who finally said that, that we both need to decarbonize. So basically build products and services that emit less or hopefully emit zero, but at the same time, suck the pollution we've already created back out of the atmosphere. And that can happen in a wide range of ways from direct air capture, those literally those big fans out in the desert that are sucking air to accelerating biological processes. So crushing up rock that carbon loves to attach to, growing algae or kelp. And so we have a fund dedicated exclusively to that. And it's a it's a burgeoning industry. We've partnered with companies like Stripe and the Frontier Group that they brought together. And so that was a separate fund because frankly, you know, lower carbon dates back to 2017 when I quote unquote retired from the traditional investing. We wanted to move to this, to this investing because we had a thesis that as much as the, the Kleiners of the world and the Kosas of the world had, had gone ahead and pioneered this space and were thankful for those efforts, back then the business models just didn't work. Mm-hmm. But we saw the cost of building this stuff come down so precipitously and the revenue available and the spend available go up so precipitously. It reminded us of the early days of Y Combinator. And so where the cost of building a company had come down by orders of magnitude. And so as a result, we jumped in. In those early days though, Carbon removal wasn't really an industry. There wasn't really a lot of demand side and the supply side couldn't scale. But late last year, we started to see a couple billion dollars of demand for carbon removal amass on the sidelines. And at the same time, the technical solutions for carbon removal were starting to scale. So we built a new vehicle around that. And uh, Ryan Orbuck, who led that program uh, over in sourcing those companies over at Stripe, came and joined us to head that up. And so that is a separate fund. We also have a separate fund for nuclear fusion. We're the largest and most active fusion investor in the world. And so but otherwise, we're, otherwise we're managing $2 billion right now dedicated to a full panoply of climate solutions. So, Chris, you mentioned a couple of different ways to, uh, you know, grab carbon um, fans, chemical agents. Um, people are injecting it underground and sequestering um the gas and concrete for buildings. I guess of these different approaches, is there one that makes you sort of most excited? I mean, personally, I love any time that we can take existing biological processes and just accelerate them. And Mm -hmm. so nature's pretty damn good and smart. And we got into this situation we're in because we started screwing with nature. And so relying upon nature to bail us out is actually really helpful sometimes. So anytime we learn of an enzyme or a bacteria that actually accelerates a process that's amazing. And by the way, this is the same on the decarbonization side. So we have a company that makes industrial chemicals using enzymes instead of oil. And so there, I I don't think I can say exactly, but it's a nine figure run rate growing precipitously with 60% margins selling a commodity. And that's because the enzymes do the work instead of relying upon oil. And when they go sell that to a factory owner, I have a feeling that the factory owner doesn't vote the same way the founders of that company do. But they simply ask two questions. Like, is it hydrogen peroxide and is it cheaper? All right, well then F it, I'll buy it. And that's at the heart of the business we're doing. So anytime we can capture, and we have microbes that that replace uh, ammonia-based fertilizer. We have microbes that eat plastic. And so anytime we can accelerate a pre-existing natural process, That really, really warms my heart. I mean, right now, what our company Running Tide is doing uh, as they farm kelp out in the sea is just a massive, massive contribution with gigaton potential uh, impact on removal of carbon in the atmosphere as well as restoring ocean ecosystems. And it's fun. The the founder of that company is is, uh, one of 13 boat captains in his family, a young guy who went back to Maine to found that company. And it's just really remarkable the breadth of talent we're seeing. That it is, it's interesting what's happening across the board. Um, and I think synthetic biology to your earlier point is super interesting, you know, um, with regard to carbon capture, um, you know, money doesn't always produce results. It's really exciting that there's so many options now and so much money is flooding into this. Um, 
But I guess, do you worry that industry is going to kind of use some of these, you know, saying, oh, we're, we're putting money into this marketplace or we're putting money into this technology so we can continue sort of on with our bad behavior? Is that a concern for you? I, I, I'm not concerned by it because, frankly, digging up and burning old dinosaur bones is expensive. It is just inherently costly. And so every time we remove that from a process or a product, we make money. And so companies can continue polluting that way, but it actually is expensive. And carbon has real value. When we capture carbon, there are uses for it. We upcycle it into jet fuel. And so, and we're now embedding it in stuff like concrete, et cetera. And so, so there is value there. And so companies can continue with what you call bad behavior, but that's just bad business. And so, yes, I mean, greenwashing and fake ESG funds and stuff like that are bullshit. But the reality is anyone who continues down that path is just going to get left behind by the biggest economic transformation in the history of the planet. And Chris, also for skeptics out there, um, this is such a new area. So there's so much going on. But um, is there reason to think that carbon capture will will, will work at scale? One data point I pulled uh, ahead of jumping on the phone here was uh, that the world's largest carbon a direct air capture facility that's currently under construction is expected to remove only 0.0001% of the carbon dioxide emitted globally every year. I'm yeah, sure it, when, I, when I hear that, it sounds like the person who thought there'd be no need for more than seven computers on the planet. And so betting against technology, chemistry, and physics is a bad bet every time. And if you want to line up against that bet, I'm here for you on the other side of it. And so <laughs> the reality is we keep seeing step functions and geometric progression in the advancement of these technologies. There's no doubt about it. And again, direct air capture is one of the paths to carbon removal. And so I, I, I love the naysayers and I'm kind of like, Okay, stand back and watch. Like I'm at this point where I kind of don't give a shit, and I'm like, either you're helping or get the fuck out of the way. But right. um, but I bless anybody who says that shit. They just haven't been in the lab. They haven't seen what's happening, and they're literally betting against what we're seeing is a rate of change in technology that is steeper than ever before. And why? Well, first of all, it's compute power. I mean, the amount of compute power that a team of three scientists now has available to them would have cost a half a billion dollars seven, eight years ago. And so now, in a lot of our industries, experiments that used to take a year or two years to design, execute, and digest can be done hundreds of times per week. It's literally that steep a curve. What people with that, what a team of three or four young scientists can do in synthetic biology now, with CRISPR and understanding what they're designing and testing that and seeing the protein folding that's coming out of things like DeepMind right now, it's just unprecedented. And so what happens is the rate of change, the rate of accomplishment in these companies makes me as a 47-year-old feel just daunted and old, frankly. You know, we, we do this thing, I mean, like John Doerr is famous for it. I think he got it from Andy Grove, the OKRs, where we set out the objectives and key results for our company. So what is this company going to do and how are we going to objectively measure that? And in traditional venture capital, those OKRs are kind of 12 to 18 months out. You raise your seed round and you start planning for maybe going back out to market 12 to 14 months from now. We set those OKRs very ambitiously. We, we often don't even kind of set them to be achieved 100%. We want to be shooting for the moon. And yet what we're finding over and over again is that our companies are blowing through those milestones in six and seven months that the second round for that company is being raised in the same calendar year. It's just nuts because of what they're able to achieve and the pace they're able to achieve it now. And so if somebody else wants to find themselves on the other side, arguing against that progress, even if they've, I mean, just look up everything that people said about photovoltaics and how you'd have to cover the entire surface of the earth twice with, photo, with, with solar cells in order to provide solar power. Like, I think we've seen what's happened with price parity and the efficiency of, of photovoltaic cells there. I think we've seen what's happened in wind. Those without subsidy anymore are price competitive now. And so I love, love, love the naysayers. They kind of fuel me, actually. You know, the, the, another criticism I read, and of course, people love to criticize uh, this whole space, um, is that we're focusing too much on carbon capture. And if we don't alleviate problems with associated with um, fossil fuels or other problems, including, um, you know, air pollution caused by fossil fuel plants or water contamination caused by fracking, we're basically playing a losing game of whack-a-mole. Um, I guess, you know, how do we make sure that these other pieces uh, receive equal time and attention? 
Well, first of all, it's not either or, it's both. And decarbonization, meaning reducing emissions, is getting way more attention. And that's fantastic. That's the way it should be. And so, um, and, and so I'm not worried about that at all. And again, that's just, I drink Haterade for breakfast. I love it. And all this bullshit that comes out of people who aren't actually paying attention is just kind of amazing because that to me is the arbitrage. That's where I see the market opportunity. And that's why, you know, I love all the LP interest we get in our funds and people want to come with their ESG money. But what really gets me excited is when Halliburton and Shell and Exxon are like, can we please invest in your fund? And the answer is no, but I love it. They're coming to us out of sheer greed. When I see the biggest banks in the world who are also doing palm oil deals come and try and invest in lower carbon, that gets me excited because it's working, because they know that sheer greed and the sheer market forces that are driving costs down and providing better substitute goods for people around the world are, it's working. And so I have no allergy to making money. And, and I know I've just never seen TAMs as big as these right now. I mean, we are going after, like, I, I have no doubt we will have multiple companies worth trillions of dollars that emerge from our portfolio. Chris, can you just share some hard statistics that will sort of underscore all of these points, like some metrics that a couple of your companies are accomplishing that would maybe blow the socks off of um, viewers? Well, so for instance, we have a company called Heart Aerospace. They're building a 30-seat electric airplane, uh, fully electric, end-to-end. -end. I mean, even we even saw Bill Gates say it would never be possible to build a, an electric airplane at scale. And so bless him, I think he's been a really positive force for moving the space forward. <laughs> But again, uh, betting against technology is just the worst idea ever. Um, and so in this case, they set out to build a 19-seat plane, and then they realized the strength and efficiency of their engines. And what they were to deliver out of the batteries allowed them to build a much bigger plane. So there's a company that with uh, single-digit millions of dollars and fewer than 20 people was able to go from zero to billions of dollars of hard cash on the barrel orders for their planes from the major airlines in under two years. And the reason that happened wasn't because those airlines are trying to be warm and fuzzy about it. It's because those electric planes make their unprofitable routes profitable. All those little regional routes that these airlines have to fly, they cost a lot of money. Those are really inefficient planes, a lot of maintenance, multiple different types of models of aircraft. And our company can produce those aircraft. They can mass produce those aircraft. The way an electric motor is built, is just inherently different than a massive jet engine. And so as a result, we have what will probably be the most profitable aviation company in history. And with a team that fits in a, in a tiny hangar, they're already taking these orders and they'll be delivering these planes within a couple of years. And so that's the kind of progress we're seeing. There's so much that's exciting in the aerospace industry. I, I following the supersonic stuff too pretty closely. Um, I guess at what point do you think we'll see um, like a, a commercial flight? And I guess where does, it, where does the FAA stand on this company in particular? Yeah, so it's not just the FAA. This is a global thing, right? I mean, so more than, you know, almost half of our companies are outside of the United States. And frankly, Europe had a head start. They started caring about this stuff way before we did. And so a lot of the best talent comes from there. But we also see incredible companies coming out of India and, and, and Africa, places that have been, but, you know, 30 million people were just displaced by floods in Pakistan. I mean, literally within days, gone, homes wiped out. And so in places where we're seeing extreme climate conditions, we have seen a push of so many students go to school studying that and going to school to study climate as their native, uh, as, as their native academic pursuit, knowing that they want to found a company. And so, so I just want to say like a company like that, the one I told you, uh, that company is based out of Sweden. And so they're getting their aircraft approved, not just domestically in the United States, but internationally. The first major order for their aircraft that they publicized came from Canada. Air Canada ordered 30 of those planes. And so as a result, we don't see this as domestic. Now, I do think the world is getting increasingly polarized. And I do think we are going to see more and more push into this space, focus on security, national security. I mean, I think Putin has highlighted the importance of making sure that we have energy independence. And so... We are going to see an axis of the West starting to make sure that we have the minerals to build all, everything we need in the electrified economy and to process that and the inputs to satisfy the demands that, um, that uh, basically the promises that the major automotive manufacturers have made. You know, we have a company called Lilac that is uh, on its way to becoming the largest lithium miner in the world. Lithium mines are traditionally very beautiful, but also very horrible. They're very wasteful. They use a lot of water. Um, and so Lilac is a company based here in the United States that 
mines lithium using uh, 99% less land and 90% less water, but 10,000 times faster than incumbent methods. No shit. I mean, that, when I, the first time I saw that, they claimed 5,000, and I was like, okay, that's the craziest graph I've ever seen. And now yeah. after a couple of years of operating, it's literally 10,000 times faster. And so, so I think this company is so interesting. Can you, I, I was hoping we could talk about it. It's like these little beads that pick up the iron and then they, in like brine. And um, somehow there's like a wash that gets rid of all the contaminants and the brine can go back into the source. Is there like an easy way to explain what it's doing? Because I think it's so interesting. I think you just did. Are you applying for okay. a job? <laughs> so yeah, essentially, I mean, lithium is existent in brines. People have always said, hey, we could mine lithium from the oceans. And that's true. It's just very, very dilute. And so you'd need an abundant kind of endless source of power in order to pull it out of the oceans. And so there are places on the earth where naturally occurring, it's pretty dense. Chile and Bolivia are particular places like that. And so there, lilacs technology, exactly those beads that basically adhere to lithium ions are great and highly effective, but they also are possible to operate in places where the brines aren't as dense, particularly here in the United States, where we have concentrations higher than the ocean, but not as a high concentration. And so, but if we're going to meet any of the targets and the major automotive manufacturers and the airlines and everybody on electrification and home electrification and battery backup for your solar array, then we're going to need a lot of lithium. And, uh, and luckily, the best producer of it in the world is a company right here in the United States. Well, that's what I wanted to ask, because obviously you are an environmentalist um, and you're also an investor. And this company sounds really promising. I don't know how quickly it can scale. Just um, from your perch, do you think about investing in competitors if it means solving a problem sooner than would be possible otherwise? No, I mean, look, I, I, at heart, I'm a capitalist. And so I, I do deeply care about the environment and I just see a market based opportunity there. My wife, Crystal, and I, and we're business partners, have been philanthropists in this space, but we actually see the market force and co-opting the market as the biggest lever to really bring about change. You know, guilt and shame may get like 200 to 300 million people on the planet to make active material purchase decisions just based on not wanting to feel bad. But if I'm going to get 7.7 .7 billion more people to do the right thing, it is going to be by going right to their pocketbook. I need the Costco shopper to make the conscious choice, even if they, and, and ideally, if they have no idea that that's the choice they're making, by just providing them a better alternative. If somebody can produce lithium, though, in the same or very similar way, um, I'm just, it doesn't make sense to you to sort of back two horses. I, I guess maybe my, my question is how, how quickly can this company scale what it's working on? And, and relatedly, Chris, um, you know, so much of the late stage funding has dried up, and I just wondered if that's a concern, um, or if, you know, this new, uh, bill kind of, um, fills the gaps or if there's other, you know, entrants coming in here. We have a deep science team where we evaluate, uh, everything we see pretty like from a technical standpoint, I would say we probably have the best science team right now. Um, we're not the only science team. So we collaborate with other investors in the space that we really admire and bounce mm -hmm. things off each other, I would venture to say we have the best deal flow in the space right now. We don't see every deal, but we see the best deals. And again, part of that comes by being inherently collaborative in this space right now. And so, you know, we pick what we think are the companies most likely to succeed, but at the heart of venture capital is picking a company and then being part of that company and doing everything you can to serve that company. I mean, we always tell entrepreneurs, like, interview us. So, you know, it's not, sometimes there's this like, idea that it's a power dynamic, like VCs have given you money. And we always tell our founders, no, like you're giving the VC the opportunity to buy some of your stock. Is the amount of stock you're going to have worth, uh, is the amount of stock you're going to have left after the VC bought some be worth more as a consequence of that investor getting involved or not? If the answer is no, then don't let them buy it. And so as a result, we're picking a company and then we're going in and helping the company build. That's it. I mean, the reality is I am a shitty public markets investor. Um, I've shown that time and again. And so, and that's partly because I can't rig the game. I can't help that company be more successful. But with private markets, I can. So with private markets, we can identify the best companies, we can invest, and then we can roll up our sleeves and get in there and make them more valuable by recruiting talent, by helping with their products, by attracting more complementary and strategic investors, by helping them get bought or finding their way to the public market. 
That's what we do. I mean, it's unfair, but we're really good at it. And that's what we do. And that's the investors in your audience who are successful. That's what they do too. And so, um, and so in this case, it's not just like throwing darts at a board and hoping we picked the best lithium miner. Like we know we picked the best and we're going to make them better. Chris, they're going to like pull us off here with like a virtual hook in a second. But I wanted to say, I do have to credit you. Your website is so great. Um, I think you do a great job telling your company's stories. Uh, what you write, what, what you present, they're so uh, digestible, I think, to a, a wider audience. So thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to ask you selfishly, before we go, you did make your early fortune by <laughs> on Twitter. I have to ask, Elon Musk is owner, thumbs up, thumbs down. I mean, look, with Twitter, I... Uh... It had the, uh, we had the very best intention in the early days and it used to be really healthy. And now I feel like we invented cigarettes all over again. And so I think Twitter is toxic. Um, it's addictive and it preys upon our most primal dopamine driven instincts in the world. And uh, I'm not convinced that anybody who is, um, who's agitating for more freewheeling content and less moderation there is going to improve the health of that environment at all. And yeah. so, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I'm I'm saddened by what Twitter's become, and I wish we had seen that. I think we were all naively excited about the democratization, giving everyone a voice, and and we were naive about how it'd be weaponized. And so um, that's sad. Yeah, so hard, so hard to imagine it, I guess. Anyway, Chris, great talking to you. Thank you so much. Really, really a treat. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks.